Well, good morning. So glad to see all of you here this morning and to know we've got a bunch of folks also that are joining us online. I, I don't know if you know, we typically have a, almost as many people joining us every week online as we do here in the room. And for a lot of folks, this is the place that they experience IBC for the very first time. So we are thrilled to know that you have joined us this morning. As we begin, I just need to let you in on a little secret about us preachers. One of the most terrifying things for a preacher is the mid sermon sneeze, right? Because I'm up here, I'm doing my thing, and then you can sort of feel it coming on, right? But there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. I got a microphone wrapped around my head. There's not really any way I can shield the microphone from the sneeze, so I'm gonna blow your eardrums out when it happens. Um, I don't see any, uh, 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 what am I looking for? Uh, Kleenex, right? There's no Kleenex anywhere in sight, so it's gonna be the shirt sleeve. I don't know if it's gonna be projectile sneeze, right? You know what I'm talking about? A yeah. little bit of extra glistening on my mustache through the rest of the sermon, right? Um, now you're sitting there going, why on earth is he saying this? I'm fighting through a head cold this morning, so just, just be prepared. This may be the day, right? So Shelly's got Kleenex for me down here if I need it, but I'm gonna fight through it and we're gonna make it, right? This, this may be the most bizarre opening to a sermon that I have ever preached, so forgive me. If you're here for the first time, um, sorry. Um, if you have your Bible or you wanna access it on the IBC mobile app, let's go to 1 John chapter four. 1 John chapter four this morning. It's back uh, towards the end of your New Testament, 1 John chapter four. If you've been around a while, you may have heard me say before that what you think about when you think about God is one of the most important things that you can think, right? What you think about when you think about God is one of the most important things that you can think because the, what we think about when we think about God shapes who we become, because we have a particular conception of who he is, of what he's like, of what his character is, oftentimes that shapes who we are becoming. And therefore, what you think about when you think about God is one of the most important things that you can think. But there is a corollary to that idea. If it's true that what you think about when you think about God is one of the most important things that you can think, it's also true that what you think about when you think about what God thinks about you is one of the most important things that you can think. Right, did you, did you follow that? What you think about when you think about what God thinks about you is one of the most important things that you can think. So let me ask you, what do you think about when you think about what God thinks about you. The passage that we're gonna look at this morning, I, I think is one of the most beautiful, one of the most profound passages in all of the New Testament that speaks to these two realities. What we think about when we think about God and what we think about when we think about what God thinks about us. As Sissy mentioned, we're in the fourth week of, um, of Advent, this season that in the life of the church that, that marks the, the um, commemoration of Christ's arrival. It looks back to the, his first Advent uh, when he came in the manger in the weeks as we prepare for the celebration of Christmas. But it also looks ahead to the end of the biblical story to his second Advent when he returns again in glory. And it thinks about how we live stretched between these two Advents. And this Advent season, we've been in a series called All Things New, where we really are looking at the end of the biblical story and thinking about what are the implications of that for our lives today. That as we talked about in the first week, there's coming a day when, when everything will be made new, the restoration of all things, the renewal of all things, the reconciliation of all things. And this truth has profound implications for our lives today, that, that hope will be realized that peace will be perfected, that joy will be unending. And so this morning, we come to the fourth week of Advent to talk about the theme of love. What is it that enables us to have that secure sense of the promise of hope? What provides us with peace 
while we wait? What is it that uh, enables us to have a joy that we know will never be taken from us? It is the love of God in Christ Jesus. It is the love of God that led to the incarnation, the, the first advent. It is the love of God that led to the crucifixion, the resurrection, and it is the love of God that will lead to his future return. Love will conquer all that squelches hope, all that disrupts peace, and all that steals joy. The incarnation, right, the first coming of Jesus, is the incursion of love into the darkness of this world. And despite all the ways that it looks like the darkness is winning, we are those as followers of Jesus who hold firmly to the truth that one day love will be victorious. Now, how do we as God's people live today in light of that reality? Well, I think John speaks to this in 1 John chapter 4 in verses 7 through 10. Listen to these words from the Apostle John. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, you may have caught it. John, in this little passage, in these three little verses, is, is preoccupied with this idea of love. He repeats the word love nine times in the space of just three verses. And it's actually 10 times if you take into account that the very first word translated here as dear friends is actually the word beloved. Over and over and over in the space of just these three little verses, John speaks to this idea of love. And this is consistent with what he does throughout the remainder of the book. Because in the remainder of the book, 46 times, John will use the word love in the space of just five chapters. You think Pastor Barry repeats himself a lot, right? John wants this to get deep down inside of us. He wants us to hear it and to be transformed by it. Because he has been transformed by love. You know, he uses the word love so much that some scholars actually refer to John as the apostle of love. Isn't that a great nickname? The Apostle of Love, right? Now, if you know anything about this person, John, who wrote this book, we get introduced to him in the Gospels, and we get a very different picture of him there, right? You remember what his nickname was in the Gospels? The Son of Thunder. Because apparently there was something thunderous about John's personality. Something about John that was brash. Something about John that had, had rough edges, something about John that could get angry. There's one place where John talks about, should I call down fire from heaven to wipe out the Samaritans? I mean, he's a son of thunder when you find him in the Gospels. And now, decades later, after following Jesus for all those years, the son of thunder has been transformed into the apostle of love. John has been transformed by love. And I think John knows that that's what God wants for each and every one of us. He wants our transformation, that we, like John, might become more like Jesus. But he knows that that transformation happens as we embrace the love of God. Now, I wanna just work our way through some of the phrases that we find in this little passage. And the first one that I think is worth pointing to and underscoring is that John here says, God is love. God is love. What do you think about when you think about God? John says, you gotta think about love first and foremost because this is who God is. It's not just that love is one of his actions. It's that all of his actions are love. It's not just something that God does, it is who he is. Therefore, it characterizes everything that he does. Love is of the essence of who God is. 
God is the source of love. God is the definition of love. God is the manifestation of love. In fact, earlier in the book, John would go so far as to say, we wouldn't even know what love is apart from seeing the love of God revealed in Jesus. 1 John 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So if you were to ask God, if you were to ask John, what should I think about when I think about God? The first thing that he would say is self-giving love. This is who God is. And then I think John goes on from this statement about who God is to talk about what that love is like, right? What true love does, what true love looks like reflected in the character and the work of God. And the first thing that I think that we see in this passage is first, the true love demonstrates, right? True love demonstrates itself. You you see this in John's words, God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. Right? If you're one who likes to mark in your Bible, you can just underscore that little word showed because that's what true love does. It, it shows itself. It demonstrates itself that true love is more than just a feeling in one's heart. It's more than just a disposition that one has that true love demonstrates itself. It shows up in action. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter five, verse eight, where Paul says, But God demonstrates his own love in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. True love is not just a feeling. True love shows up in action. This is how God showed us his love. And he goes on from there then to say he sent his one and only son. That I think that just underscores this idea that true love moves toward Right? True love demonstrates itself. True love moves toward the object of its affection. This is how he showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. The first advent, the, the, the coming of Jesus, his birth in that manger, that this is God moving toward us in love because that's what true love does. It moves toward the object of its affection. Um, on May the 15th, 1995, I met a young woman named Kim Smith. One year and three days later, she would marry me and become Kim Smith Jones. Poor thing, she just moved up in the alphabet a little bit, right? But, uh, but that night that I met her, I mean, I, we had this long conversation and pretty quickly I was, I was smitten. And I went home that night, literally, I told my roommate, I said, I met a girl And I'm not even gonna bother asking her out. I'm just gonna ask her to marry me. Now, I didn't actually do that. A lot of talk, right? But I didn't actually do that. But what happened over the course of those next few weeks is that uh, we each had kind of these friend groups, myself and two other guys and herself and two other girls. And our friend group started to do a lot of stuff together. We were just hanging out together, going places together, eating together. And, And one Sunday, we, uh, we went to church together. We all went to church at the church that I grew up in. And and little did we know at the time, but that that would become the day that she and I had our very first date. Now, the story of our first date is so romantic and involves cat urine. You, you can't make this stuff up, y'all, right? If, if I lost some of the visitors with this whole sneezing thing, I definitely lost them now with cat urine. But I, you, you can't make this, this is what happened. Right? She comes to church that morning and she left her window down the night before and a cat got in her car and left something behind that just caused the whole car just to smell horrible. And so she came that morning and she's talking about what happened with her car and she's gonna have to spend the rest of the day cleaning out her car, trying to get that smell out of the car. What's she gonna do to get the smell out of the car? And I said, I'll help. Pretty smooth, right? (laughs) She's like, no, 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 no. You're not helping me clean out my car after the, no, 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 no. no." I said, no, I'd I'd be happy to help. She insisted I, I, I couldn't help. We parted ways. I called her later that day. I said, hey, can I come over and help you clean your car? It was persistent, right? Nothing if not persistent. Um, she says, no, 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 you're not gonna help me clean out my car. 
So I said, okay, well, how about I just take you to dinner instead? Pretty smooth, right? <laughs> yeah? And it worked out. We went and had dinner. We had Italian food. And the rest, as they say, is history. You can't make this stuff up. Now, that's a silly example of the idea that love moves toward the objects, the object of its affection, right? I moved toward her. It's a silly example of a profound truth. That the God of the Bible, the God of the Christian story, moves toward the objects of his affection. I say it a lot, this, friends, is the difference between Christianity and every other theistic religion. That every other um, theistic religion, there's, the story is that God or God's made the world, sets the world to spending, and stands at a distance and watches as the world he made spins madly on. Only on the Christian story does that God move toward the objects of his affection, move into that broken world, taking on a suffering upon himself beyond our capacity to imagine in order to redeem us and give us a hope beyond it. This is the essence of the Christian story, that God has moved toward us in Jesus. This is how he has showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And he goes on, he says, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Once again, if you like marking your Bible, you might just underline the little phrase, he loved us. True love demonstrates, true love moves towards, and true love holds on. This secure love that is ours through Jesus Because he loved us not because we loved him first. He loved us not because there was anything in us worthy of his love. He loved us because he chose to love us. He he loves us in a way that is secure, a way that is not based on our performance for him. That he loves us with a love that is secure. You know, I think in a lot of ways, we are deeply shaped as people to hold, if not consciously and and externally, at least internally, a sense of performance-based acceptance. That we so often attach love with performance. And I think we do that. I think we struggle to believe the secure love of God in Jesus for a couple of main reasons. One is that we are all deeply flawed people who had deeply flawed models of love. Right? Let's, let's think about the second one first. We all had deeply flawed models of love. Even those of us who had really great parents who, who tried really hard to, to love us well, to show us that sense of unconditional love, nonetheless, they, they are deeply flawed. Those coaches, those, those teachers, those people, those mentors in our life, as well-intended as they might have been, they're still deeply flawed. And some of us had parents or teachers or coaches, people in our lives that, that, that were not trustworthy, where that love was tied to our performance. And so what happens for so many of us from very early on in life, we, we get this sense that the way in which we are loved is based on how we perform. If I am good, I will be loved. If I achieve, I will be loved. If I perform, I will be loved. And on the flip side, if if I fail, if I'm bad, if I don't achieve, if I don't perform, then I won't be loved. We we get deeply pressed within us this idea of performance-based acceptance we have a really hard time trusting in the secure love of God. Not only are our models of love flawed, but we know ourselves to be deeply flawed. We know the reality of our own unworthiness. 
And sometimes when confronted with the reality of our own unworthiness, it's hard to trust in the secure love of God. And what happens is shame wants to come and tell us lies about those things about ourselves that are true. Shame wants to to hold us in that grip and make us believe how could God really love you? And so we find ourselves unable to trust in the secure love of God. You know, it's interesting in the ancient world, everybody in the ancient world was was religious. But um, among the, the different religious options in the first century world, those gods that they worshiped were, uh, were unpredictable, right? They were, they were capricious, they were mean, they were easily offended. And so people found themselves always feeling insecure, always feeling the need to try to appease the gods. And if heaven forbid you get on the gods' bad side, then what you have to do is you have to try really, really hard to win that God's favor back. And Christianity introduced something radical into the world. A love from God that is not based on performance. A love of God that is secure and trustworthy. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. I love the way that Isaiah captures this reality of the trustworthiness of God's love. Isaiah 54, verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. If the mountains are shaken in your life, if the hills are removed, if it feels like the world is falling apart all around you, his love holds you secure. Love demonstrates, love moves towards and love holds on. Finally, true love sacrifices. True love sacrifices. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Again, if you wanna underline, you can underline that little word, sacrifice. That word, atoning sacrifice, the original Greek word is the word hilasmon. Now, that word is directly connected to the word hilasterion, which is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to refer, interestingly enough, to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you're going, wait a second, you got all Raiders of the Lost Ark on me for a second. Trust me, right? Watch this. What is the significance of the Ark of the Covenant? Well, for the people of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant was in the center of the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God, and the Ark of the Covenant was this box that was built to hold the tablets upon which God wrote the Ten Commandments. So his law was captured there in this box, but there was a lid that went on top of it. Um, And this word, uh, hilasterion, um, it's sometimes translated mercy seat, or the place of propitiation. And what would happen is that the ark was in the center of the Holy of Holies and once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. It would take the blood of a sacrificial lamb, a pure and innocent lamb, and it would sprinkle that blood on the hilasterion, on the, the lid of the ark. And the idea of this, which is, in our minds, a very strange, almost gruesome picture, but the idea was to press deeply into the heart of God's people. The reality is that God looked down, and he didn't see just the violation of his law by his people, but rather he saw their sin covered in the blood of a sacrificial lamb. One who was innocent, but whose blood covered over their sin. And this was a picture for the people of the Old Testament that, came, that became a reality in Jesus. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb whose blood covers over our sin. This is love that he sent his son into the world as an atoning sacrifice for sin. True love sacrifices. One of my favorite passages that speaks to the love of God compares the love of God to the love of a mother to the love of a nursing mother who's care and concern for her infant child. 
It's found in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 and 16. And the Lord speaking through the prophet says this, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she's born? Though she may forget you, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. A tender image of the love of God, like the love of a mother with her nursing infant. And yet, God says, even if she could forget that child, I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. I came across a story recently of a woman named Catherine Benefil from a little place called Harrison, Arkansas. A few years ago now, Catherine's home erupted in flames and the, the whole house was consumed with fire. The first responders arrived and, and they began to fight the fire to try to put out the flames and they entered into the building to try to find if there was anyone left inside, any, any, any survivors. And as they made their way upstairs. They found in an upstairs bathroom, there was Catherine, body badly burned by the flames. But she had her entire body wrapped around the body of her little five-year-old son. And they rescued both of them and they rushed them both to the hospital and Catherine later would die from her burns but her little boy survived because she sacrificed herself for him. The true love of a mother, because true love is sacrificial. And John says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice show his sacrificial love for you and for me. And so what are the implications? What's, what's the application of this truth for our lives? Friends, it's simply this today. Embrace the love that embraces you. Embrace the love that embraces you. You see, I think sometimes we have a hard time really trusting in God's love for us. And part of that is that we oftentimes feel that God feels about us the way that we feel about ourselves. That we have names that we've come to, to embrace as true of who we are. Failure. Disappointment. Divorcee. Addict. And the list of names go on and on. Names that we have come to believe is what's most deeply true of us. But friends, what is most deeply true of you is you are the beloved child of God. And that love is secure. And that love is not based on performance. One of the people who has most deeply marked my life when it comes to understanding and embracing the love of God is Brendan Manning, and I love the way that he says it. He says, we unwittingly project onto God our own attitudes and feelings towards ourselves, but we cannot assume that he feels about us the way that we feel about ourselves unless we love ourselves compassionately, intensely, and freely. And here's the punchline. Define yourself as, as one radically beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. What do you think about when you think about God? What do you think about when you think about what God thinks about you? God is love. And he loves you. Define yourself radically as one beloved of God. What is it that secures for us the great promise of hope? What provides us with peace while we wait? What enables us to have joy that we know will never be taken from us? It is the love of God in Christ 
It's the love of God that led to the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the love that will lead to his future return. Love will conquer all that squelches hope, all that disrupts peace, and all that steals joy. The incarnation is the incursion of love into the darkness of this world. And despite all the ways that it looks like the darkness is winning, we are those who hold firmly to the truth that one day love will be victorious. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the love with which you have loved us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, God, for this reminder that you are love. It is the very essence of your being and that everything you do is born of love. And God, that you have demonstrated this love for us in sending your son Jesus to move toward us, to enter into the brokenness of this world. That that love is secure, that love holds on because it's not a love that comes in response to our loving first or our being worthy, but it is a love that you have chosen to lavish upon us in Christ Jesus. And it is love that is sacrificed for us. That Jesus laid down his life to demonstrate your love. And God, I pray today that we would hear that truth and that we would embrace the love that embraces us. God, if there are any who are here this morning and they've never come to that place where they have trusted in Christ for the first time, where they have trusted in his love for them, that today would be the day that they would truly embrace the love that embraces them. God, for those of us who have trusted in Christ for our salvation and yet still struggle to trust his love each and every day, God, I pray that we would hear this truth, embrace it, and be transformed by it. That like John, we might be transformed by love. So in this moment, I wanna just offer you a moment of silent reflection before the Lord, before we come to communion. An opportunity for each of us in this room and watching at home to just examine our hearts before the Lord to see if there's anything there that we need to bring to him before we come to communion this morning. God, we thank you that we can come examining our hearts before you knowing the truth that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Thank you. And we pray all this in the name of your son, our savior, our sacrificial lamb, the name of Jesus we pray, amen.